Hello everybody, very pleased that you've been able to join us. My name is Andrew Cooper. I'm Dean of the School of Cultural Studies and Humanities and that simply means that I oversee all the courses that you're interested in across uh, English literature, creative writing, history and media and we've we're delighted you've been able to join us this afternoon. Thank you for making the time. I've got several colleagues with me today. Um, Henry Irving from History, Emily Sobel Marshall from English and Dan Kilvington from Media. And very shortly they're going to tell you a little bit more about their areas and I'll explain to you how you can ask questions as we go through and at the end of their presentations which are very short we'll pick up all those questions and have a bit of a discussion. On all of our courses, you, you can be guaranteed of three things. Great teaching and wonderful support for your learning. Lecturers who will bring you all the latest developments and thinking in the fields that you're interested in. And opportunities to develop and apply academic knowledge and skills that are really highly sought after by graduate employers. Today, we just want to spend a little bit of time explaining to you how being in the city region of Leeds allows us to do things in a certain way and to add an extra dimension to the courses that you're interested in. So a, a global outlook characterises all of those courses. What we're talking about in addition to that is the opportunity at a local level to uh, apply your learning, to grow your experience and develop your confidence as the next generation of talent who will graduate from our courses. So very shortly now, I'm going to invite Henry to say a little bit more about what this means in relation to history. What we'd like you to do is if you have questions or comments as the presentations take place, please use the chat bar function at the side to add your questions. And at the end of the presentations, I'll pick those up and put them to our speakers so they can provide a little bit more information for you. So without more ado, let's move on. And Henry's going to start us off by talking about what happens in the area of history and the course is attached there. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and yes, thank you to everybody for coming along this afternoon. Um, as Andrew says, if you've got questions as we go through, just put them in the Q&A and we can pick those up at the end. Um, so my name's Henry and I'm one of the historians working in the School of Cultural Studies and Humanities. And I teach on both our British history and our working with history strands of the degree. I'm going to explain a bit about what that means in practice uh, by using the example of a module that I lead with our third year students. And the module I want to talk about is called Public History Project, and it involves uh, working with organisations outside of the university to create a piece of public history. So instead of writing an essay, uh, you might create a website or a walking trail. And this year's project was connected to my research on the Second World War. This is a photograph uh, which was taken in the aftermath of a bombing raid on Leeds. And I'm going to come back to this image in a moment. Um, I just want to say at this point that the building in the photograph is the city's old museum. And I think the body language of the two individuals at the front of the shot gives you a sense of see buildings like this uh, really to reduce to rubble as a result of the Second World War. As a historian, I'm fascinated uh, by the way that ordinary people coped with these uh, type of events. It's really hard to imagine what it must have been like to live through. And of course, this isn't just an academic question. The world continues to experience conflict and ordinary people, people like those in the photograph, continue to be in the firing line uh, or caught up in it. And I think the legacies of the Second World War can tell us something about that experience. The, the past year has been a particularly important one for historians like me. Uh, so not only was it the 80th anniversary of the Blitz, but ideas around Blitz spirit, the idea that people kind of carried on uh, in the face of adversity, uh, were frequently invoked during the coronavirus pandemic. So this is a newspaper cartoon that was published in March of 2020. Uh, and the image may look familiar to any of you that have studied history at A-level or GCSE. Uh, it's based on a very famous wartime photograph uh, depicting St Paul's Cathedral in London. But here, instead of smoke and flames, uh, we have the cathedral engulfed uh, in the coronavirus. Uh, and I will come back to this again in a moment. I'm going to come back to Leeds now. 
because here in Leeds, um, the 15th of March uh, was a particularly important anniversary. It was the 80th anniversary of the raid, which knocked out the museum uh, and was the city's worst uh, during the history of the Second World War. And it made sense to try and commemorate this uh, with a project uh, that would sort of encapsulate and, and think about those events. So to do this, I pulled some favours uh, from Leeds City Museum, uh, from local archives and from libraries, and we collected as many historical sources as possible uh, to share these uh, with the Public History Project students. And the students used these sources in order to explore the topics that they thought were most important. Um, and over the next three slides, I've got some examples. So this is a government report, and this is a really nice example of the type of source that you might find in an archive. Uh, this particular example was taken from the National Archives in London, and we were able to provide a digitised version to the students. So it's a government file. Um, it contains lots of information about the bombs that were dropped on Leeds. Um, and the secret report that was produced immediately after the raid kind of plays down, uh, I think, the seriousness. It's also written in quite formal language. So um, if your screen's big enough to make it out, it says incendiary bombs were dropped um, at around 2340, 116 fires were started, and then it goes through the sort of operational aspects. So different stages were invoked, uh, but luckily all of this was quickly got under control. Now, if we compare that to the next slide, my next example is from a slightly different perspective, um, because when it comes up, this is the way the raid was reported in the press. So this is a copy of the Yorkshire Evening Post, which was one of Leeds' main newspapers, uh, published the day after the raid. And we can see here that the examples are a bit more colourful. The language is that little bit more personal. So talking about acts of heroism um, and talking about the way that this attack was dealt with. Now, I just want to very quickly draw your attention to the headline here, because I think this is really funny. Um, censorship rules during the course of the war meant that it was um, illegal to give precise locations of bombs. So Leeds is here referred to as a northeast town. Uh, and the idea here was that uh, the bombers might not know that they'd hit their targets if you didn't give the town. But I love the way that the journalist has sort of sidestepped this rule. Uh, you might just be able to make out the headline. It's at the top of the image. German claims of air attack on Leeds and then subheading heroic defence in northeast town. Um, so, you know, hats off to these journalists for really pushing those rules. Now, if I can go to the next slide, um, I think this is the third and another perspective on the, uh, on the event, um, because this is a much, much more personal source. So this is the page of a private diary uh, kept by someone called Arthur White, who was a shopkeeper from Beeston in Leeds. And this really does give an insight into the way that the, uh, the raid was experienced by ordinary people. And again, it gives an insight into how strange, almost unfamiliar, almost overworldly it was to see buildings and places that were very familiar being reduced to rubble. So White writes, uh, we passed roped off streets, groups of people standing together talking, long queues, buildings with their windows blown in, streets with their roadways full of broken glass, and so to our destination. Uh, and the diary entry narrates through this process, taking you into the centre of the town. Now, at this point, I should repeat that the students I was working with were in their third year, so they'd had plenty of opportunities to work with these types of sources before. Uh, and during the course um, of, of our courses, we like to give students lots of opportunity to get their hands dirty with historical sources and to build the skills that they'll need in order to be able to analyse them. Our courses also contain a very strong element of public history with opportunities to create uh, sort of quite creative assessments uh, at various stages of the degree. So we want you to be able to produce websites, um, posters, even podcasts, as well as writing really good essays. And we can see what this looks like in practice on the next slide, because this is the, uh, the final output from the Public History uh, Project of this year. So the students had used their skills to focus in on different topics, and these ranged from the damage caused by the raid through to acts of heroism and even the impact on children. Each group created content for a bespoke web page which brought these ideas together uh, and presented them to the public. They also helped to update a digital map which pinpointed the location of different bombs. Um, and all of this is linked from our website, so if you want to go away and find out more, you can do after today. So the website um, was a really nice undertaking and it was launched in time to commemorate the 80th anniversary of the attack. Um, and the response was really incredible. Uh, so thousands of people visited the website. The map was featured by the BBC and students from the module featured on television and radio to talk about their findings. 
Uh, we also got a really nice write up from the Yorkshire Post, which is on the right here. And all of this unlocked a final element for the project because people who had lived through the raid or who had family connections to it got in touch in order to share their stories. And I think this is a good reminder of the legacy of the conflict. These were events that continue to resonate and have an impact 80 years later. And the combination of local stories and global history really hit home. And to give you just one example of this, um, in the past week, I've been speaking with a 90 year old man from New Zealand who grew up in Leeds um, stumbled across the map and has been in touch to share his story. So it's true that our students really are having a global reach with their work. Because I really want to end by saying how proud I am of this module uh, and also saying that it's a very good example of the way that our courses run. So as your tutors, we're really keen to help you put your learning into practice um, and to create work that you can share and also be really proud of. And you'd expect me to say this, you might expect Andrew to say this, uh, but it's also the case uh, that our students say this. Um, so if I could just end with this quote from Meg, uh, who was one of the students who was working on the project. She looked into actually the history of the bomb that hit the museum. Um, and Meg wrote that creating the website was a fantastic experience and that the responses from the public have been worth, uh, wonderful to see. She said that it really made all of that work uh, worthwhile. And ultimately, I think that that is uh, sort of best testament to the module, the way that we approach it, and also the kind of experiences you can have on our degrees. Now, I'm really happy to take questions about this or the history course in general at the end. Uh, but without further ado, it's over to my colleague, uh, Emily Sobel Marshall, who's going to present an example from the English course. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Emily Zobel Marshall. Uh, thanks for the intro, Henry. So I'm a reader in post-colonial literature at the School of Cultural Studies, and I teach across the English literature and English and creative writing degrees. So um, my main research specialisms are Caribbean literature, um, Black British literature, African literature. So in a sense, global writing. But what I want to tell you about today is um, to show you the ways in which our teaching and our research come together um, within the School of Cultural Studies and also how we try and engage our students with the history of our city. So, you know, being a student in Leeds, it could be quite a, a transitory experience. You know, you're just here for three years and then you leave. Um, but what we try and do is to make sure that our students have a sense of place and a sense of the history um, and the cultural scene that they're engaged with while they're here. Now, to show you this example, um, I want to introduce you to the history um, of a man called David Oluwali. And I'm the vice chair of the David Oluwali Memorial Association. So David Oluwali um, was a, a Nigerian migrant that came to Leeds in the 1960s. And the Remember Oluwali Association are an association which worked to fight for social justice, diversity, equality and inclusion. So David arrived in Hull uh, in, in East Yorkshire in 1969 and he was a stowaway on a cargo ship from Lagos. Now from 1953 to 1969, David endured mental ill health, um, homelessness and racism and destitution and police persecution. Um, this cul culminated in a terrible tragedy of his drowning in 1969 at the hands of two policemen near uh, Leeds Bridge. And there's been a lot of uh, a focus in the last year on George Floyd, who was killed um, by a police officer in the US. Now, the David Lawali Memorial Association believe that this was the first case in the UK of a policeman causing the death of a black person. Now, um, what we do at the David Oluwali Memorial Association, so DOMA for short, is that we try and use the arts and culture and especially literature and poetry as a platform to fight for social justice. And what we try and do is engage our students in doing this as much as possible. So we believe that through the arts and culture that we can bring attention to some of the tragedies of the past and to make sure that we um, as a city uh, can face the future in a much more positive light. Now, this is an example here um, of some of the work that the association have done with the help and support of students at Leeds Beckett University. So 
this was a, a 50th anniversary series of events. So it was a, the commemorating 50 years since David Olawali died in Leeds. Um, and so we had really big poets. Uh, Jackie Kay came and responded to Olawali's life in poetry. We had Linton Crazy Johnson, the dub poet. Um, and students helped to organise and attend these events. Henry, as also you've heard from Henry, Henry was working on an Olawali website with students, which reflect the difficult history of uh, David Olawali. Um, and it contained blog posts and themes around justice, race and media representations um, of the Olawali story, as well as an interactive walking tour. So we work closely in the school with the association. Um, and this is a way of engaging students in the history of their city, in the culture of their city, and also um, fighting racism. So our tutors on the creative writing degree um, also helped to select poems and short stories uh, for a prize winning anthology, which is all based around commemorating the life of Olawali. So you can see it there, Remember Olawali, an anthology. Um, it won an important literary prize. And there is another uh, anthology scheduled and we are be asking students to be both involved in submitting and selecting the work for this for this anthology. Um, we also have some exciting news that in 2023 there's going to be an Olawali sculpture garden with a with a huge sculpture by the sculpture the sculptor Yinka Shonibare, um, who's a Nigerian sculptor. And so this is a, a a really big thing for Leeds as a city. It's going to be down by the canal and it's going to be a, a memorial garden with this sculpture and a place for um for people to come together and to um and to to have to run events and and to think about you know uh, our community. So um so in the run up to uh, the opening of these sculpture gardens, we've had all sorts of events um, and responses to the Olawali story lined up. So one of them was actually incorporating the Olawali story into carnival. So and you can see here on the right hand side of the slide, um, a, a big uh, a papier mache sculpture of Olawali's face. This is David being taken on the streets of Leeds West Indian Carnival. Um, and uh, Leeds of Sydney Carnival is, is the, uh, the biggest Caribbean carnival in Europe and it's the oldest Caribbean carnival in Europe um, bar London. And another thing that we specialise in uh, in the school is Caribbean carnival cultures. And we have our, our own Caribbean carnival cultures platform which celebrates black carnival history and culture in the UK. When we, our students have been very much involved in this. Um, what you can see here is that in 2017, we organized a big conference on Caribbean carnival culture. Um, we, had, we had speakers from all around the world and much of the conference was supported by our very own students who also uh, presented at the conference as well. You can see some, uh, there's a photo there of us, uh, a, a stick fighting a carnival event that took place at the conference. Um, on the left hand side of the slide, you can see the text, the dragon can't dance. Now, with a lot of these, uh, these, these um, uh, histories that we react to and respond to, we also incorporate them into the literature of our courses. So the dragon can't dance is a text by Earl Lovelace, the Caribbean writer. And um, this, this carnival text is taught on both uh, the MA and the undergraduate degree at our school. So what you can see in the next slide um, when it comes up is young people taking uh, part in the peaceful protests uh, for the Black Lives Matter movement at Leeds Millennium Square. And these are the sort of discussions that we have around literature. We want to engage young people to have a global outlook, as Andrew mentioned at the beginning of this session, and to think about you know, what it means to be a citizen of this country and a global citizen. You know, what is their role in the world? Um, we like to think that you know, liter uh, reading and literature are not neutral. So reading is not a neutral activity. Literature is essentially political. So we, we, we like to engage our students in debates and ideas which help them to think about you know, what, what they believe you know, and where they see themselves as a global citizen of this world. I'm going to finish by just showing you um, a, a cultural event that took place that also links our students to uh, to the Olawali story. 
So this is the Leeds Literature Festival. We have an excellent literature festival here in Leeds and our students uh, participate in this in, uh, as, as, uh, as presenters and also as organisers. And we teamed up with Leeds Literature Festival um, to have an Oluwali event, which was focusing on racism and also homelessness um, and refugees and asylum seekers. The event was called Sheltering Under the Owl's Wings, which I thought was a beautiful name um, because, you know, the owl is a symbol of Leeds. So it's the idea of Leeds being a place that is a place of welcome that people can can shelter there. Um, and we had our students uh, come and, and present their poetry in this event. I'll just show you the next few slides if you just want to move through them then uh, you'll be able to see some of our students doing readings um, at sheltering under uh, the owl's wings and uh, and they really took the floor you know they were absolutely amazing our students the poetry that they shared was about home and belonging and welcome um, and uh, and they were I would say probably you know the, the the best part of the show we have a poetry slam team on the course and uh, some of these uh, young people are also members of the poetry slam team so we also had a write-up for this event that was very glowing which basically um said that you know the, uh, the, the readings in sheltering under the owl's wings at Leeds Beckett University followed in the long and honourable tradition of rabble rousing, intellectually pr provocative and emotionally charged poetry that Leeds writers have long been able to produce. Um, and then just uh, um, slightly uh, towards the end of the review, it says the student poetry slammers nearly took the roof off with powerful and thought provoking word paintings of Belfast and Derry and a bilingual Dutch poet shows the crassness of the binary divisive rhetoric um, around the Brexit debate. Finally, so um, I hope that this shows you how our, our research and our partnerships and our teaching come together to provide a really eye opening education for our students. You know, we engage them in real world, real world, world contemporary concerns and debates. Um, these, uh, this text here um, on the slide um, is actually by our, our Leeds own famous author, Carol Phillips, and is another literary response to the Oluwali story that we teach on both the undergraduate and postgraduate degree. We ask our students to respond creatively um, to this story and, and the poetry and the, and the, and the short stories that they um, come up with are, are just unbelievable. Um, we're always amazed by what they produce. So we look forward to strengthening these types of partnerships as a, as a school and also continuing to provide our students with these really unique opportunities to engage with the history and the politics and the culture of their city and beyond. Thank you for listening and I'm now going to pass you on to Dan Kilvington. Hello everybody. Uh, yes, thank you very much Emily and I think a lot of what you discussed there actually provides a nice segue into the spotlight on media communication and culture. So Thanks for thanks for tuning in, everyone. My name is Dr. Dan Kilvington. I'm the course director for Media Communication Cultures, and I'm going to talk briefly around some of the things that we've talked about already. So, how there are global issues, global concerns, which Emily uh, pointed out, but how they apply local and how we address them through our curriculum, through our research, and how our students address these as well. Um, so that's what we're going to do and both of these kind of two case studies that I'm going to talk through link really nicely together. The first one is ar around research informed teaching and the work that I've done uh, to challenge racialized injustice within sport and particularly football and then how that opens up opportunities through our through the, the race culture media module for our students to get involved and actually challenge um, challenge racism in, in an area of their choosing, whether it's fashion or, um, you know, the news media or sport or whatever it might be. And just to give you a little bit more background on the race culture media module, which is a, a third year module, so that's uh, level six, and that's a, an optional module that the students take. And for the assessment, what we ask the students to do is come up with a campaign to challenge racialized injustice in one of the areas that we cover on that particular module. So you'll learn about this as a, as a global thing. We'll look at the US, we'll look at the UK, we'll look across Europe and further afield as well. 
and then we encourage the students to either address this in in the UK uh, or locally or further afield of their choosing. OK, and, and what we do see in that module as well is we invite in uh, various organisations who are locally based. So we've got the West Riding County FA, uh, which work within Leeds. So I've got contacts there and they come in and talk about the work they do around inclusion and diversity in football. I've also brought in uh, Stop Hate UK as well. They're also based in Leeds. They've come in and talked to our undergraduate students and postgraduate students as well. Also got links with Show Racism, the red card in their Cardiff office and also the North East office. They have come in and talked about the work they're doing. In terms of the global problem, if we look, if we look at this at a macro level, racism is an issue that affects the entire world. This is a pandemic and the tragic murder of George Floyd led to this rippling effect in terms of race relations and, and protests uh, across the world. And that one at the top there, that photo, that's a Black Lives Matter march uh, in the UK, uh, sorry, in the US. And the one at the bottom is right here in Leeds. So again, showing me the local, uh, the, the local uh, issues and it's still uh, relevant here. Um, so through our work, we actually try and address this through local solutions and activities. I've used research informed teaching and I've gone out there and I've done interviews with uh, many black Asian minoritized ethnic uh, coaches and scouts working within football and worked with uh, various industry, industries such as the West Riding County FA and in April 2016 formed the Creating and Developing Coaches which is the Inclusive Coach Network and what that essentially was designed to do was to bring together disadvantaged and underrepresented groups within football and had three clear aims and the first one was to showcase opportunities and pathways in local football okay so what are the opportunities that exist in Leeds or, or West Yorkshire how to get involved in them the second one was to actually facilitate a space uh, to actually bring together certain groups who were without certain networks for example and then the third and final one was to highlight and inspire um, through the use of role models. So th those were the three aims of creating and developing coaches. And on the next slide, it talks through what the event was. And the best way to describe it was basically speed dating for coaches. And that's kind of what the ethos was, was to bring together loads of coaches who were interested in working within football, but possibly didn't have those networks, um, didn't know where the opportunities were, so what we did is we ha had kind of six or seven round tables and on each round table we had a member from a, an organization whether it's the fa whether it's kick it out whether it's a, a local football club who were talking about the opportunities that existed for these coaches who were current and aspiring who wanted to get involved in the game i would be like the referee to use a football analogy i would have a whistle and every 10 minutes I'll blow that whistle and the coaches would, would move around the room. So at the end of it, they've spoken to all of these different uh, organisations and learn about the opportunities that are on their doorstep. And um, so the top one uh, there is uh, at Bradford, that's at, um, you know, Valley Parade. Then we've got Ellen Road, which is the one at the top in the middle uh, with Assad leading that, um, leading that table there. Then we've got the head of DNI at the time, which was Kevin Coleman, that's at Huddersfield. Down in the bottom right, we've got, uh, that's myself there, that's at West Ham. We've got West Riding County FA in the middle. We also hosted events at Sheffield, Manchester, um, and, and at Burnley, uh, among other places as well. So overall, we worked with around 250 football coaches uh, across the country uh, from top level, you know, you wait for a license to, to beginners who were just looking to start out and using the networks that I've managed to acquire through working in, uh, working in Bradford and, and Leeds, we managed to partner with West Riding County FA, Manchester FA, Lancashire FA, National FA, collaborated with a load of different stakeholders such as Kick It Out, Sporting Eagles, and that's led to positive changes for people in the in the in the kind of the local uh, the local environment really. And now we're running this uh, in. Uh, in Bradford, uh, a new multi-million pound sports centre and that's now supported by the, the National FA. 
So in terms of research informed teaching, which is integral to what we do at the university across all of our courses from English history and media, um, this is research that I've gone out and done uh, along many, alongside many of my colleagues as well. And that underpins what, what, what we do. So remember I said right at the beginning, the, the module is race, culture, media, and our students are um, tasked through their assignment to create a campaign strategy to challenge something. So I draw on what I've done in terms of football and use that as a, an example to hopefully inspire you guys to actually go out there and think about how you could do something. And I also bring in my contacts to talk about the activist work that they're doing in different areas as well. Now, on the next slide, it links to what some of the students have done on my module in terms of their assessments. And there was a couple of students a couple of years ago. So it was Jessica Allen and Megan Hussey. And they presented um, an amazing campaign. And it was absolutely brilliant. Probably the best presentation I've seen from students um, in all the time I've been teaching. And they came up with something which was called End Beauty Bias. And it was to try and challenge the, the, uh, bas basically the lack of inclusivity that exists within the beauty industry. They came up with a full marketing and branding strategy to try and to challenge this. And it was absolutely fantastic. Now, through the links that we have, through the industry links that we have in Leeds and West Yorkshire and further afield as well, I was working with a company at the time called Relish Research. They were also working with Body Shop. So through, uh, through this assessment that these students had created, which was absolutely fantastic, it allowed me to introduce them to Relish Research, who were also impressed, and then fast forward that they're pitching to Body Shop about how to make their company more inclusive in terms of uh, the products that they offer. Um, now, both of these students have gone on to, to do really well and we're really proud of them. So Jessica Allen is now working in digital marketing and, and Megan actually used this experience from the module to actually get a job with Kick It Out. So worked with Kick It Out for a year or two afterwards. So again, we're very, very proud of that. So hopefully that kind of gives you a, a big overarching view about research informed teaching, the, the types of things we do on the modules, how it is global issues but links to the local uh, as well and has local opportunities for you. Um, and on this final summary slide, I think to, to kind of summarise would be that our degree in media offers uh, a global outlook in many ways, but it also absolutely connects to the local area through what we do. And I think we've kind of exemplified that across the, the three presentations, really. So from my work of creating and developing coaches, which is creating opportunities in Leeds and, and West Yorkshire to trying to set up industry links for our students as well. So using the assessments that they're doing and the work they're doing on the course and applying that outside the curriculum as well to real world opportunities or real world opportunities, I should say. Um, so we create global global graduates, OK, essentially. So we look at things on a macro level, but focus down and we equip you with a range of transferable skills so you can navigate different spaces, industries, environments, etc. Um, and, and I guess to finish really Leeds and, and the West Yorkshire region, um, it has a burgeoning media and cultural sector and the opportunities are here and they are growing. Um, especially in things like digital marketing with the pandemic. There's a lot of opportunities there. Organisations are changing how they operate. So there's new possibilities that are opening out of this as well. Um, in terms of what happens or, or opportunities and leads, well, we've got Channel 4, which is coming and we've just set up uh, really a student opportunity for Channel 4, which I've been involved in setting up. And we've also got BBC Radio Leeds uh, and I hosted an event there last year. We've also got ITV um, alongside many other opportunities um, as well. So it's an exciting place to be is what I would like to, to end with. And I think that is from all from me, actually. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Dan. We've got some questions that have come in. We we'll need to move to them fairly quickly. So the first one is for Henry, actually. And uh, it's a double question. Were, were the speakers originally from Leeds? And if not, what, what sparked your interest in the location and combining it with study of history? 
it wasn't directly addressed to me, but I've, I've seized this question because I think it's an absolutely brilliant question that's come in from Miriam. Um, I'm not from Leeds and the students on the module, the vast majority of them were not from Leeds. Um, but I think the key thing is that we've all got a connection here. So when you choose a university, you're not just choosing uh, somewhere to study, you're also choosing somewhere to live, somewhere to spend, you know, quite an important part of your of your lives. And I think we're really keen to get you involved in the city. Um, we're really lucky that we have a city centre campus. We're really connected uh, to Leeds as a city. And we've also got links with the kind of organisations that I was talking about uh, and that my colleagues have talked about as well. Um, so on the project that I introduced, um, we couldn't have done it without the City Museum, without the West Yorkshire Archives, without the Local Studies Library. And they provide the resources that enable our students to do well. Um, and I think this actually links into a question that's just come through about whether we need to know the local area to do well on the courses. At the beginning, no, you do not. Most people are coming in completely fresh, but one of the things that we try to do on the course is to sort of scaffold that knowledge, enable you to have the skills to go away and use those archives when it comes to things like your own dissertations. So we build that, we build those opportunities into our modules right from the outset. Um, so I'm not from Leeds, um, but I like to think that I know the city quite well. Uh, back over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Henry. Great answer. Uh, the next question is also from Miriam. Uh, maybe Emily could pick this one up. Um, it's really in relation to some of the societies and groups that you mentioned, Emily, and whether students have to join those societies or indeed what are the options for becoming involved in societies at the university? Thank you for that uh, question, Miriam. Very good question. So um, there isn't a requirement to uh, to join a society. There's all sorts of different societies um, and, uh, and 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 possibilities for placements and um, and and mentorship roles um, from different uh, groups. So it's up to you what you would like to choose. Um, but we do encourage to we do encourage you to try and and be a sort of outward facing um, as possible. So. Some of the um, some of the things that you might want to do, you know, while you're a student with us, is to do some placement activity with, for example, People Tree Press, who are a local um, Black British and Caribbean press, um, and we've had many placement opportunities there that have been really successful. There's also a chance to work with our local literature festivals. So I mentioned the Leeds Literature Festival. There's Bradford Literature Festival as well. Um, so you can become involved in those sorts of things um, should you want to. We've had really successful placements for our student at Hallmark Cards, um, so who do greeting cards. And uh, and one of our students has stayed on and, and had some paid work there. So um, it's not um, it's not a, re a requirement as such, but we do encourage you to get involved um, with societies and 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 with um, uh, organisations, you know, beyond the university. We think that this gives you some really great work experience, you know, some real world work experience. Um, so we encourage our students to do that as much as, as possible. There'll be uh, modules uh, both uh, uh, um, in the second year and in the third year that you can take, which are specific employability modules where you'll be able to choose which placements you might want to do with your time with us. Um, so there's plenty of opportunities, but there's what I'm also trying to say is that, you know, you also um, have the autonomy to uh, to choose, you know, the direction in which you want to travel in terms of the societies and groups that you want to get involved in. I hope that answers your question, Miriam. OK, thank you, Emily. We've just got time for um, two questions pushed together, which I'm going to ask Dan to pick up just very briefly, Dan. Uh, what's the balance between group and individual assessments and do these projects help you to get better grades? Yes, thank you. Good question. Um, first of all, I think there, there is a, a mixture between group and individual. I think that cuts across all three subject areas we've, we've talked about today. Um, so in, in media, we will have things like essays and photo essays and presentations and things. We've also got a, an employability module at level five um, called Media Professionals Workshop. We've also got Applied Humanities as well. That is a group project because you work with a media professional in, a, in, a, in an area of media that you're interested in, whether it's radio or uh, digital marketing, uh, whatever it might be. 
Um, so you you work on a basically an industry type uh, project uh, there. So that's group. There are individual presentations and things as well and individual essays. And at first year, what I would try and say is you get a lot of support at first year. You get support all the way through, but especially at first year, because that's that transitional uh, transitional year. You work with an academic advisor. The study skills brought into uh, certain modules as well. So you learn about how to actually do these assessments that you might have never done before as well. So that's important to mention. And your presentations in media, for example, in first year, I, we don't make you do any of those by yourself. So you'll be working in a group, uh, a small group. So you've actually got that confidence. You're working alongside others. Whereas when you get to second and third year, you might be doing some kind of presentations by by yourself. Um, while we're still talking about assessments, what I would say is we try and be innovative with our assessments. I think that's quite an important uh, thing to get in there. We've got things like podcasts that we'll ask you to do rather than just presentations. We'll get you to pitch things a bit like Dragon's Den. We'll get you to design lifestyle um, type TV shows or different types of TV shows. Um, and yeah, essentially what we do th th for a lot of it is try and mimic industry settings and like real world scenarios within the assessments that, that we offer. Um, and we've got, I think, five new final year modules coming on soon as well, which are, are very exciting and again, very innovative in terms of their ass uh, assessment. Um, to go back to the precise nature, the balance, there is a balance there, uh, absolutely. And do these projects help you get better grades? I suppose that's quite a tricky, tricky thing to answer. What we try and do is we we coach you through. So we've got this thing called making the grade. So we have um, specific checkpoints during the modules, during the semester where we actually talk explicitly about the assessment and give you top tips and what to do and, and possibly show you uh, past work, um, etc. We've also got a making the grade tab on our virtual learning environment called My Beckett. So that's where we populate a folder and put videos on specifically related to the assessment. So you get a lot of help and support through that. Plus, you have an academic advisor that you work really closely with as well. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for that. Uh, another question has popped up from Georgia. Uh, I'll pick this one up. It's whether the Oluwali Society is within the university or, or external to it. Um, it's external to the university, but with really strong ties to what we do. So Emily is, is part of the society as well as working within the university. But we also have a, a formal collaborative arrangement that allows students to get involved and again apply their learning and develop knowledge and skills through the projects that we can do with an organisation like that. Well, sadly, that, that just about brings us to the end of time today. Um, one thing worth adding in addition to everything that's been said and which has run through all the presentations is that this gives you an extra edge on graduation as well. You will have had the opportunity sh to show your knowledge, but also how you can use it and the skills that come with it. And that's really attractive to employers. I spend a lot of time talking to employers across a whole range of areas. They're fascinated by the projects that we've mentioned today and the other things that students do, but for good reason. They see talent, they see people who know what they are talking about and know how to use that to good effect. And we'll build your ability to do that and help you grow your confidence so you can step on from graduation and follow whatever career path that you want to. So thank you to our speakers, Henry, Emily and Dan. And most of all, thank you to everybody who's joined us. Uh, it's been great to have your company. I hope you've been interested in what we've been telling you. You can find out more information on the website and there'll be contact details there as well, so you can follow up with any questions that we weren't able to address today. And just finally to say thank you to everybody and all the very best. Bye for now.